Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Today I would like to discuss with you some recent results that 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 I obtained uh, studying the formation and the evolution of massive black hole binaries in circuit nuclear disk. In this work, my principal collaborators are uh, Monica Colpi and Albino Perego and Bernetta De Vecchi at the University of Milan in Italy, and uh, Francesco Art and uh, Luca Paredi in Como, in, at the University of Como in Italy as well, and uh, Marta Volontieri and Matteo Schulzkowski at the University of Michigan, here in Ann Arbor, and uh, Lucio Meyer at the University of Zurich. So I decided to start this talk with this movie that is related to a recent paper by Governato and collaborators recently submitted to Muras, because I think it clearly shows how we think uh, galaxies form through uh, multiple mergers. So this is a cosmological simulation. You can see the formation of a first uh, disk-like protogalaxy. Mm -hmm. And this disk-like protogalaxy is going to, to experience a merger with these other guys. This is all gas. This is, this is gas, yeah. Well, there are also stars, but we cannot really, yeah, we cannot really see them. And so the remnant of, the, of this first merger is a, this is an equal mass merger, and uh, it's going to be another disk-like galaxy due to the accretion of cold gas in, uh, in, um, in streams. And this second disk-like galaxy is going to undergo another merger with this one and to form, in a few seconds, a, a Milky Way-like disk galaxy. Now, now you can see the stars that are the blue points and the red are uh, old stars. And uh, right, so if during the cosmic history a large fraction of galaxy forms due to uh, multiple mergers. And if a large fraction of galaxies <coughs> host a supermassive black hole in their center, so massive black hole pairs should form in a large number during the cosmic history. And the, the first study, one of the first study about the dynamical evolution of massive black hole pairs during a, gas, a galaxy merger, in particular without considering the presence of gas during the galaxy merger, has been uh, discussed in a, in a seminar paper by Begelman, Blenford, and Rees in the 80s. And they found three principal stages of the three, three principal phases of the dynamical evolution of the massive black hole pair. And in particular, the first phase, in the first phase, the, the, the loss of gravitational energy, of uh, orbital energy and orbital angular momentum of the two supermassive black holes is driven by dynamical friction processes. And now we know that the dynamical friction is asserted in the, in the early stages by the dark matter halos onto the two uh, stellar component of the galaxies and in uh, later stages by the stellar remnant, the stellar galaxy remnant, onto the two supermassive black holes. And this process, we will see, is <coughs> particularly efficient for major mergers, as discussed in Caligari et al., a paper recently submitted to PJ or in Kazan Cides et al. 2005. So a second phase is uh, the tribal interaction. So if dynamical friction is able to bring the two supermassive black holes from separation of separations of the order of tens of kiloparsecs down to a separation of the order of a parsec or less, then the two, binary can for the two supermassive black holes can form a binary and interact with single stars via, via tri tribal interactions. And so they can exchange the orbital angular momentum and the orbital energy with the stars and decrease their separation. So if the tribal interaction with stars is able to bring the two supermassive black holes down to milliparsec separations or so, then <coughs> gravitational wave emission takes place and uh, the two supermassive black holes can reach the final coalescences in less than an upward time. The first, pro the first process, dynamical friction, is as I already mentioned, is particularly efficient for uh, major mergers. And this is because, I don't know why it's changing. Okay. And this is because during a minor merger, the tidal field of the primary, of the primary galaxy strips a large fraction of the mass of the secondary. So that the, the mass of the secondary decreases 
decreases and uh, the dynamical friction efficiency decreases as well and the two supermassive recoil can form a, a pair that starts a separation of the order of kiloparsec or so and this is shown in this plot by Caligari et al again and uh, we can see the, the massive black hole pair uh, separation as a function of time here the scale is kiloparsec and here giga years and we can see that in a 1 to 10 merger so a minor merger at a redshift equal to 3 in, if we don't have any gas in the galaxies that is the red line here in the plot the two supermassive black holes stall at a separation of the order of 5, 10 uh, kiloparsec well, 1, 5 kiloparsec so how massive are the oh, yeah. yeah, no, no so how massive is the black hole here that you're putting it? I mean well, in this case the two black holes have two different masses okay, and the, the first one it should be something like uh, 5 times 10 to the 6 or masses or so and the other one scales so with it. So why is the operation so, so efficient then? I mean, you know, the mass is tiny compared to the halo mass. The, the dynamical friction onto the supermassive, onto the black holes. Yeah. Yeah, well, at the beginning, at the beginning, the, the so secondary... Do the have similar masses? You know, they don't fall into the position. Of course, of course, but the, the secondary supermassive black hole is embedded inside the, the satellite okay, so galaxy. Uh, okay, so it's the halo, uh, okay, so it's like the sub-halo that's being dragged in. I'm so, so, yeah, it's the sub-halo that is driving inside, and the problem is that during the dynamic interaction, the dark matter, well, at the beginning, the dark matter halo is stripped due to the, due to, due to the tether field of the primary, right. and then the stellar field, the stellar uh, component is stripped as well. Right, so if the stripping process is sufficiently fast, the mass decrease decreases right. sufficiently fast, and then the two supermassive black hole, uh, at this point, the secondary is uh, alone, and so the dynamical friction time scale is too long. And that's why the, the secondary right. is okay, stuck. So, okay, so it stalls at the point where the host carrying it in gets destroyed. Yeah, exactly, exactly, that's the point, yes. I'm sorry, but the computer seems a little bit, uh, well, anyway, <coughs> come on, <laughs> this is strange, well, we probably can do something like this, if you don't mind, and uh, I will show you the movies in a separate stage, it was working two minutes ago, so, okay, so, yeah, so also the second problem, the second process can not be efficient in bringing the two supermassive black holes down to the final coalescence. And this is because during the interaction with the single stars, the, black hole, the, the two black holes transfer the orbital, orbital energy and angular momentum to the stars that are evacuated from the center. So the density of the stars in the nucleus of the galaxy is decreasing, and so it's decreasing even the, the rate of interaction and the two supermassive black holes can stall a separation of the order of a, a parsec or a sub, a 0.1 parsec, <coughs> something like that. And of course in the stellar, in a purely stellar background, have been proposed some possible solution for this last parsec problem and typically considering non-spherical backgrounds that can trigger a centrophilic orbit and so refill the, the loss cone of the binary or the presence of massive perturber that can scatter the stars in the, uh, through the, to the center. Well, we are interested in looking how the, the presence of gas can change this, uh, the dynamical evolution of massive black hole pair, and the, in particular if the presence of gas is able to bring the two massive black holes down to the collisions. So the only simulation with the resolution necessary to follow the two massive black holes starting from the galaxy merger down to the formation of a binary has been presented in Mayer time 2007 and we can see different snapshots of this simulation in this, uh, in this slide. In particular we can see when uh, just after the, the first pre-center pre the two galaxies are tidally perturbed and so there are strong inflows of gas in the center of each galaxy and this over the central over density of gas merge in uh, the final phases of the merger, creating a central uh, circumnuclear disk with masses 
of the order of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 10 to, between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10 solar masses that are comparable to the one observed in the ultraluminous infrared galaxies. And the two, well, the, the length scale of this circunuclear disk is of the order of, you know, 100 of parsecs or so. And the two supermassive black hole evolves, evolve inside the circunuclear disk and form a binary at the separation of the order of few parsecs that is comparable to the spatial resolution in this simulation. So, there are a couple of, a couple of more studies between me and Andres Escala studying the evolution of uh, a massive black hole pair inside the second nuclear disk, and in particular we are interested in uh, trying to understand if the two supermassive black holes can reach the final coalescence at the end of this process, so if dynamical friction is able to, is efficient in bringing the two supermassive black holes down to a subparsic separation, and if the two supermassive black holes are observable during their dynamical evolution inside the second nuclear disk. So to do that, we realized, <coughs> let's try, because here there is a move. Yeah, now seems to work. We realized a, a suite of high resolution embodied SPH simulation, considering the heterodynamical of the, or the heterodynamics of the gas, and our initial condition as are composed by a central supermassive black hole of four million solar masses placed at rest at the center of a composite structure that is formed by a circunuclear disk that follows a master profile with a, a, dens a surface density profile that goes as uh, r to the minus one. The total mass of the disk is 10 to the eight solar masses and the radius of the disk is 100 parsec. And here you can see the profile at, from different point of view. And uh, the second nuclear disk is embedded in a stellar bulge, a spherical stellar bulge that follows a, a plumber profile with a total mass of, that is seven times more mass in than the second nuclear disk, and the plumber length scale of 55 parsec. So the second nuclear, yeah. So why a mesto disk? I mean, that's pretty kind of puffy compared to what we see in the disk. Sorry, can you repeat the last part I mean, of isn't the question? a little flat? Oh, it's well. Flat and exponential? It, it depends. This depends really on the region you are looking at. So, yeah, so the point is that the, the master disk has been proposed for the first time in this kind of simulation by Escaletal and in some way can, uh, you know, mimic the observations that, that for example, Sanders and Mirabel uh, took for the ULIRCs, for the ultraluminous infrared galaxies. But of course, the, the, our choice is absolutely arbitrary. Yeah, so in this way, of course, we, I tried this to, to run some simulation with an exponential disk with a, a scale length of 50 parsec, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and it doesn't seem to change drastically in the, in, the, in the, but of course, you can change the mass and the density profile and see what happens, yeah. So in, uh, well, the circle nuclear disk can be composed by gas or stars, or both, a combination of both. And uh, for the gaseous component, we used a pure adiabatic evolution with a polytropic index that can be five over three, that means a pure adiabatic evolution for a monoatomic gas, or seven over five, that in some way mimics the equilibrium between cooling and heating in a star forming regions. And uh, for each simulation, we added the second supermassive black hole with the same mass of the primary, starting at 50 parsec separation, and the secondary can be co- or counter-rotating with respect to the circunuclear disk, and can be on circular on, or on a centric orbit with initial eccentricity of 0.7, but in this presentation I will focus only on the eccentric simulations. So every set, each set of initial condition has been used for two different Simulations, in particular, in one, we use the we set the supermassive black hole as only mass particles, so they cannot accrete gas particles during their dynamic evolution. And the other one, the massive black hole can accrete gas, so they are sink sink particles in our in our simulations. And in particular, we the gas particles can be accreted only if their total energy, so the kinetic plus the thermal plus the potential energy, computed in the reference frame of the supermassive black hole we are considering 
is less than a fri uh, fixed fraction of the gravitational energy. And uh, we used 0.7 as a fraction. That means that a gas particle can be accreted only if it is bound to the supermassive black hole. And so we need to resolve the bond the oil radius of the supermassive black hole to see some accretion. In this way, we can relate, it, we can relate the, the accretion processes to the orbital evolution of the two supermassive black holes. And during our simulation, we don't have any kind of AGM feedback, so we can change the mass and the, and the linear momentum of the supermassive black holes, but we don't have any kind of feedback onto the gas. So let's start with the results regarding the dynamical, the dynamical evolution of the two supermassive black holes. I start with a simulation with a low resolution, a resolution of the order of a parsec. And uh, in particular, in the upper panel of this plot, we can see the relative separation between the two supermassive black holes as a function of time. And uh, the two lines refer to a simulation in which the two supermassive black holes are embedded in a gaseous disk and the red line to, the, to a pure stellar disk. So we can see that the two supermassive black holes can efficiently lose their orbital energy and angular momentum and form a pair at a separation of the order of a parsec that is comparable to our spatial resolution. So they can't go a smaller separation. And another interesting process is that during the revolution, the eccentricity of the, of the pair is decreasing, both in the stellar or in the casual case, and uh, the, we start with a, a, an eccentricity of 0.7 that here you, you cannot see because we start at 1 and finish with an eccentricity of 0.1 or so. And this, uh, this process is related to the different effects that gravitational friction exerts onto the secondary supermassive black hole, the, orbit, the orbiting supermassive black hole, at different phases of its orbit. And uh, we can see that both the, the, the pairing and the circularization of the two supermassive black holes does not depend strongly on the composition of the disk. So when you say gaseous versus stellar, you only mean gamma of five thirds versus gamma of seven thirds? No, 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 no. I mean that the, the one disk is, is composed only by gas particle, okay? And in this particular simulation, has a gamma that is equal to five or three, right? And in the other one, it is purely stellar. So we don't have any kind of hydrodynamical interaction. And uh, we model the disk with a, a, you know, with a velocity dispersion that is proportional to the sound speed of the gas so that the, stability, the, the profile of the disk is the same. Yeah. Is there not lots of other particles that you're using? In this simulation, we have, so the total mass of the disk is uh, 10 to the 8 solar masses, and we have 2 times 10 to the 5 particles, so it's something like a few hundreds of solar masses per, uh, per particle. So right. Two bodies kind of in, and the coordinates more not, not so much because we have a sufficiently large uh, softening radius, so the three body scattering is not so efficient. Okay. And when we decrease the, we will see that when we, when we decrease the, the softening, I multiply the number of particles per 10. So that the tripod interaction is always almost negligible. Right. Okay, so in particular, well, I can skip this. In particular, far from the, the apocenter, the supermassive black hole that is on an eccentric orbit is orbiting with a, a, a higher speed with respect to the lo le the lo its local environment. And so it can trigger an overdensity wake behind this trail, and the, the gravitational interaction, the dynamical friction exerted by these, these gas particles onto the supermassive black hole decreases its energy and its orbital angular momentum. On the other way, at the apocenter, where the black hole spends a large fraction of its orbital time, it is moving slowly than, the, than its local environment, so that it feels like a wind of gaseous particle flowing in this direction, Okay, and the gravitational interaction forms an overdensity wake in front of its, of its path, and the dynamical friction pulls the supermassive black hole in the direction of its motion, increasing its orbital velocity, and so its orbital energy and uh, the angular momentum. But 
at the epicenter, the, the velocity of the supermassive black hole is perpendicular to the radius, and so is the force. And so the, the gravitational torque is maximized near to the epicenter, and these two processes together are so that the orbital energy is decreased, decreases faster than the orbital angular momentum, and so the black hole can circularize during its orbital evolution. So now I'm going to present you some new results that are, that are unpublished up to now, and in particular I'm looking at a simulation where the secondary supermassive black hole is co-rotating with respect to the, to the circonuclear disk. It's embedded in a pure gaseous environment with a polytropic index equal to 5 over 3, and the spatial resolution is of the order of 0.1 parsec. So we can see that during the orbital evolution, the two massive black holes decrease, decrease efficiently their uh, uh, separation down to a, an orbital separation of the order of five parsecs or so, and then they stall. So this is, in some way, a new result. Here we need to find the physical process that, that make that the two supermassive black holes can stall because we are far from our uh, numerical resolution. And in the lower panel, we can see that the circularization process is still, efficient, is still efficient, but the final eccentricity is still different. It's not zero, and so the circularization is not complete. And we discovered that these two processes, the styling and the remnant of the, and the finite value of the eccentricity, depends on the core formation in the central region of the circonuclear disk. And uh, this is true both for a simulation in which the supermassive black holes can accrete or cannot accrete gaseous particles. So it's as absolutely we have to find the dynamical process that formed this core in the central region. And in this plot, we, I plot the surface density profile as a function of radius for four different times. And we have the black line, the blue line, the red, and the green that refer to time equal to zero at the beginning of the simulation, 2.5 mega year, 5 mega year, and 7.5 mega year. The dotted vertical lines refer to the position of the secondary at the four different times. So we can see that a core forms well before the secondary enter in the central region of the disk on a, on a circular orbit in this region, okay, in this phase. And this is because, again, of the action, because of the action of uh, dynamical friction. In particular here, we are looking at a zoom of the central region of the disk during one of the first pericenter of the secondary supermassive black hole, and the zone where with the, with the over density in the gas is the zone that is actually interacting with, interacting with the secondary supermassive black hole. If we look at the map of the temperature in the same zone, we can see in the same region, we can see that the interacting gas particles are also have a, a larger, a higher temperature than uh, the non-interacting particles, and they have a larger angular momentum with respect to the non-interacting non, uh, one. So the secondary supermassive black hole is transferring orbital energy and orbital angular momentum to the, to the particles that interact with the, with the black hole, and so this particle says, this particle have a larger temperature and a larger angular momentum and they can evacuate from the center and form a core. Okay. So in this slide, I focus on a, a, a second simulation, a secondary resolution simulation with the same kind of disk, but with a secondary that is initially counter-rotating with respect to the disk. And we can see that even in this simulation, they the two supermassive black holes stall at a separation of the order of few parsecs or so. The eccentricity is larger in this case, and the final eccentricity is of the order of 0.4. But we have a completely new physical effect that is shown in the, the lower panel where I plot the orbital angular momentum of the secondary normalized to the modulus of its initial value. So we start with minus one because the supermassive black hole is counter-rotating initially. And we can see that during the dynamical evolution, the orbital angular momentum increases with time. And around two mega year, cross the line orbital angular momentum equal to zero, where the supermassive black hole is 
instantaneously moving on a radial orbit. And then the, the orbital angular momentum continuously increases and it finishes with a, a, an angular momentum uh, larger than zero, so positive. There's and this uh, It's all gravitational interaction. Yeah, I'm going to show you which is the effect that, that gives these, uh, these, these results, yeah. And so this means that during the dynamical evolution, the, the angular momentum of the secondary supermassive black hole changes value, and so we have an, an orbital angular momentum flip, as we call it. So this is a gravitational interaction as before, and in particular now, when the supermassive black hole is, is at the apocenter, okay, the dimension... So are that you starting at the orbit you know, in the plane of, of, of the disk, or is it like... No, it's yeah. in the plane. It's in the plane of the disk. In all the simulations, I'm showing you, okay, the two supermassive black holes are in the plane of the disk. Okay. So okay. you're maximizing the effect Yeah, yeah, but, the, well, I told you that the only simulation that look at this kind of results starting from a galaxy merger is the one shown in uh, Mayer et al. And in that case, the circunuclear disk formed because of the collision of two overdensity regions around the two supermassive black holes. And then the two supermassive black holes the two supermassive black holes are orbiting in the same plane of the new forming circunuclear disk. That's why they, they, well, so we can go back and take a, a fast look. A fast. Oh, this slide has something that doesn't work. So yeah, the point is that the circunuclear disk forms uh, due to the interaction of these two blobs, right? That and the, the two supermassive black holes are embedded in, in these two blocks, in these two blob, uh, blobs, and moves with the same velocity, right? So the, the angular momentum of the pair and of uh, the two blobs is the same. And when they, they merge, the circunuclear disk, okay, has the same plane the, than the orbital plane of the two supermassive black holes. So, of course, it could be different if we already have a circunuclear disk and a, a secondary supermassive black hole that is coming in another direction. But that's why we, we choose to place the, the two supermassive black hole in the same plane of the circunuclear disk. But the black holes can counter-rotate in relation to the disk. I know, this is, well, in the co-rotating case, in the co-rotating eccentric case is exactly this, this case. The counter-rotating is, you know, a, a sort of toy model to see what happens. Okay, so these are the results for the counter-rotating case. And, uh, well, this process I was going to discuss is because the, this effect is because the secondary is moving in the other direction, so the over-density wake is exerted always, all the time, behind the supermassive black hole trail. So the secondary is pushed in this direction and its velocity is decreased. So after a few passages, and exactly after uh, a couple of mega years in this simulation, the, velo the tangential orbital velocity of the secondary is zero. And it's moving in a instant instantaneously on a radial orbit. But then we have to wait a long time before it reaches the, the, the center, so that, and the action of dynamical friction is continuous, so that it starts to corrotate with respect to the circunuclear disk before reaching the center. Well, there is the same uh, core formation problem that we discussed before, so, so that the two supermassive black holes stall <coughs> at the end of the simulation. But here we have this new feature, so the formation of a transient cusp in the center that is present and when the, the secondary supermassive black hole is still counter-rotating. It, it is due to the dynamic interaction between the circunuclear disk and the supermassive black hole that triggers inflow into the center. Right. So, in this slide, I'm showing you a co-rotating or a counter-rotating supermassive black hole embedded in a, in a circunuclear disk with a polytropic index equal to 7.7 .7 over 5. That is, as I already told you, uh, to mimic in some way the, the equilibrium between uh, cooling and heating in stand-forming re stand region. 
the spatial resolution is of the order of 0.1 parsec, and these, these two lines refer only to the simulation with non-accreting supermassive black holes. And so we can see that for the counter-rotating case that is shown with the, the red line, the two supermassive black holes can reach a final separation of the order of 0.1 parsec that is of the order of our, of our spatial resolution. So they, pairs, they pair efficiently down to our spatial resolution. The co-rotating case doesn't seem to stall, but the simulation is not already finished, so it's not finished yet, so I cannot discuss the results. Anyway, the, the rate of the orbital decay are different, the rates of the orbital decay are different, and in particular this is because uh, in the counter-rotating case, during the orbital spin flip, the secondary passed very near to the center, and uh, until it's, it's counter-rotating, it triggers inflow in the center so that it is embedded in higher density region when it, it uh, pairs with the, with the primary supermassive black hole. So is the mass enclosed you know, here in, you know, dominated by, you know, by the black holes? In, uh, in gas, you mean? Oh, yes, oh. Well, yeah, so under 10 parsec, the dominant component is gas, right? And uh, the total mass in gas under 10 parsec is something like 10 to the 7 solar masses. And at one parsec, is it, is it still dominated by the gas? I mean, Sorry? And at one parsec, you know, well, you know, is it also true that it's still dominated by the gas? Well, in, in one parsec, no. So the two black holes form a, a binary around, uh, I, would, I would say, between 1 and 2 parsecs. Right, so when the mass enclosed in gas is of the order of the mass of the binary. So inside here, there are something like a uh, few times 10 to the 6 solar masses in gas. But the point is that the, the binary interacts with gas that is well outside its orbit. So it can continuously decrease its, uh, decrease its uh, uh, separation. Some resonance of something you're saying, like, well, like you know, put, put the gas out of it. What's the mechanism, I guess, you know, uh, well, you know connecting you know, the binary to the gas of our radius? No, we can describe this later on, or? No, I, so probably I didn't understand the, I didn't understand the question. Can you try to repeat? What's the mechanism, you know, connecting the binary yeah. to the torque, you know, with the gas of our radius? Yeah. Is there some resonance, like, like oh. flat resonance, or? No, no, well. Well, not exactly because, you know, the, the disk here is a little bit more complex and is not two-dimensional. It's very difficult for us to, to define some kind of resonances. But what we see is that the, the interaction that removes the orbital angular momentum and the orbital energy is exactly the dynamical friction. But, you know, the dynamical yeah. friction depends on the... The frequencies involved, you know, for the binary orbit compared to like the gas orbit are very different, right? Yeah. No. Well, well, the point is that the dynamical friction in our simulation is more efficient for, is efficient only, if you want, for the gas that is sufficiently near to the black hole. Okay. But sufficiently near doesn't mean inside their, uh, their orbit. Right. That's what I mean. And, uh, well, for example, in this case, you can see that the presence of a more dense region inside, let's say, a few parsec, change drastically the, the, the rate of the decay of the orbit. So, for example, if you don't have enough gas inside, I would say, five parsec or so, because outside, the, 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 let's say, the relative velocity between the gas and the, and the binary is too high. So the dynamical friction is extremely poor, let's say. It's absolutely not efficient. But if you have enough gas inside few times the, the, the orbit of the black hole, so you can still, uh, did I answer to your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, I would like to look at possible accretion events onto the supermassive black holes. And here, I show a comparison between uh, the dynamical properties of the, two super of, uh, the supermassive black holes 
with the Eddington ratio of the two supermassively colon, in particular the red line refers to the central supermassively colon, the blue to the secondary orbiting one. The simulation is the one with a initially co-rotating supermassively coal with a polytropic index of the gas equal to five over three. And uh, yeah, and to define the Eddington ratio, I used a fixed um, uh, radiative efficiency equal to 0.1. So we can see that the primary has a roughly constant editor ratio, slightly decreasing because of the core formation we discussed before, and the mean, uh, an average editor ratio of the order of 0.5. While the secondary has two different phases in its accretion history, and in particular before secularization takes place, the supermassive coal is accreting with a high varying uh, uh, pattern, and the, mean, the average uh, editor ratio is of the order of 0.3, that corresponds to 1.6 times 10 to the 44 air per second, and after the secularization, the, the, um, the editor ratio is more stable, and there's a mean value of the order of 0 0.44, 45, and a polarometric luminosity that is 2.5 times 10 to the 44 air per second. Of course, this depends on the relative velocity between the black hole particle and the gaseous particles, because until the black hole is eccentric, the relative velocity between the, the black hole and the gas is higher, and it's varying during the orbital period. While when uh, the black hole circularizes, the relative velocity decreases, and it's more or less constant. So why, why are these numbers about one? Do you have some range that you said uh, that, so. Yes, yes, yes. So, well, here, and so, 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 so. I have a prescription that is not a feedback onto the gas, but if the, the gaseous particle that should be accreted have a, a, a correspond to an accretion rate that is higher than the Eddington one, so I select stochastically few particles, right? And so we have a maximum that is the Eddington, that is around the Eddington ratio because we have fluctuation, right? But until the, the Eddington ratio is lower than one, so year and year, we don't have any kind of uh, of feedback or this kind of stuff. So it is just because this is the number of particles that bound to the supermassive coil during the orbital evolution. So here, it's the true, well, uh, inflow in the bond the oil uh, sphere, if you want. While uh, in these points, we have a cutoff. These two phases are more. Uh, more uh, pronunciate in uh, the case with the secondary that is initially counter-rotating with respect to the second nuclear disk, and this is obviously from the same re uh, because of the same region, uh, reason, and in particular because the relative velocity between the gas and the counter-rotating supermassive black hole is particularly high until it's counter-rotating with respect to the disk. And we can see that when the secondary starts to co-rotate with respect to the second nuclear disk, then the Eddington ratio start to be higher and uh, almost constant because of the same process we discussed before. And here we have uh, a larger uh, difference between before and after the, the orbital spin flip. In particular, before we have a, a volumetric luminosity of the order of 5 times 10 to the 43 air per second and after of the order of 2.5 times 10 to the 44 that is approximately five times more luminous. And this is the last case that I'm going to show you for a counter-rotating supermassive black hole embedded in a cold disk, so in a gaseous disk with a polytropic index equal to 7.5, 7, .5, 7 uh, over 5, and we can see that we have the same orbital spin flip uh, process, and we have the two different regions, but in this simulation, the two different phases, but in this simulation we can see that the, the Eddington ratio is of the order of one, at least for the primary supermassive coil during all the simulation, and this is because we set this threshold, otherwise the, the primary would accrete more, right? And the secondary accrete more or less at the same rate after starting to co-rotate with, with respect to the circunuclear disk and before as the same uh, varying uh, 
you know, evolution as the case with gamma equal to 5 over 3. So here, I resume the different mass, ev mass uh, evolution histories for uh, different simulations, in particular with the black line and showing the evolution of the central, the evolution of the mass of the central supermassive black hole embedded in a circuit nuclear disk with a gamma equal to 5 over 3. And we can see that after less than 5 mega years, the supermassive black hole creates 10% of its initial mass during its orbital, during uh, the, simul the simulation. While with the blue uh, dashed line, I show the mass as a function of time for the coro initially co-rotating supermassive black hole in a disk with gamma equal to 5 over 3, and we can see that the black hole creates only 6% of its initial mass. And in the case of the counter-rotating supermassive black hole, it creates something like 4% of its initial mass. And we can see the two different phases before and after the supermassive black hole start to co-rotate with respect to the disk. And the same result we obtain for the counter-rotating black hole embedded in a colder disk with the two different phases, but this time the black hole can accrete up to 7% of its initial mass. And so, well, this, this fraction of mass accreted is not sufficient to change drastically the modulus of the spin of the two supermassive black holes, but can change the orientation of the spin due to the barden peterson effect. And this is, in some way, particularly of interest because, at least I'm interested in that, because the spin evolution, the, the orientation of the spins, plays a fundamental role in understanding the recoiling velocity of the two supermassive black hole if the, of the remnant of the coalescence of the two supermassive black hole if these supermassive black holes are going to coalesce. So in particular, if the two supermassive black hole has spins, high value spins, but aligned with respect to the angular momentum of the binary, or if the values of the spins are uh, much, are, they are almost uh, Svashi-like, so there are low kick velocity after the coalescence of the order of hundreds of kilometers per second. And uh, on the other end, if the spins are anti-aligned and in the plane of the orbital motion, so we can have higher kick velocity of the order of few hundreds, few thousands kilometers per second. And uh, this can have some interesting uh, consequences. For example, we can observe with high velocity recalling supermassive black hole that dragging in the inner part of its own accretion disk, and so that it could be, it could shine as an off-center AGN, off-centered with respect to the, to the, its galaxy, or as uh, we recently discussed in this paper, we can see the enhancement in the brain emission in the hot gas, this is particularly true for uh, elliptical galaxies, in the hot gas, due to the interaction with the recalling supermassive black hole. And so, in particular, if the motion is subsonic, we can see a, a non axisymmetric perturbation in uh, the brain emission that stands for almost a giga year. And if it's supersonic, we can see the, the typical MECON uh, feature observable in X-rays by Chandra. So these, these, and these are... Uh, mock Chandra observations. And so, to do that, we have to study the evolution of a supermassive black hole inside an accretion disk that is not resolved in our simulation. And if the accretion disk is uh, misaligned with respect to the plane perpendicular to the black hole spin during, uh, during uh, the accretion process, it starts to realign in the central region due to the barden peterson effect, so the gravomagnetical uh, coupling between uh, the spin of the black hole and, uh, and the, the accretion disk. And in particular, this is observable in this zoom in. And so, because the, the, because the supermassive black hole is changing the direction of the, of the orbital angular momentum of the gas, conserving the orbital angular momentum, we can study the torques exerted onto the supermassive black hole and how the spin can realign. And to do that, we start with our simulations. 
from our simulation, we can get the accretion rate on the, onto the two supermassive black hole. And uh, the orbital angular momentum of the accreting gaseous particles. So from these two values, we model an unresolved accretion disk around the supermassive black hole. And we can model the torques onto the, onto the supermassive black hole and the alignment of the spin. And what we find is that even assuming in a priori initial condition where the uh, relative angle between the spin of the su supermassive black hole, of the secondary orbiting supermassive black hole, and the orbital angular momentum is initially equal to pi, so they are anti-aligned, during the dynamical evolution, the, the, these uh, relative angles start to decrease, start to decrease, and at the end is of the order of 0.1, that means that the spin of the secondary supermassive black hole with respect to its orbital angular momentum is, you know, they are almost aligned. And uh, this is true for the primary supermassive black hole, for the secondary, and in particular for the secondary, both in the case in which it is initially co-rotating or counter-rotating with respect to the circunuclear disk. So it's a very strong result, let's say, and does not depend on the polytropic index of the disk. And so this means that during the dynamical evolution inside the circunuclear disk, the two spins align with the plane of the disk and with the plane of the orbit, and so we predict small kick velocity if these two black holes are going to coalesce. So why are there torques on the black hole? I mean, you know, so the torques on the disk I can see because of like the viscous effects, right? Yeah, it's because the disk is processing, but right. then you have the vertical viscosity. Right. Yeah. And you have to conserve the angular momentum. Disc. Yeah. But why are there torques affecting like the black hole spins? Well, it's the only uh, non-spherical uh, symmetric properties of the black hole. So it, it is the you know there is a coupling between the the yeah the, the space time near to the black hole and the gas inflow. So obviously this is because the gas inflow start to to you know by length steering effect start to process and then realign in a different angle because of the vertical viscosity. But the, the initial precession is due to the, to the interaction with a spinning black hole. Well, no, I understand that, right. Yeah, and uh, well, this is the, the results of the Barden-Peterson paper. And so the point is that at this point, you, you impose the conservation of the angular momentum, the total angular momentum, considering even the spin of the black hole, and because you change the angular momentum of the gas. But do you see this one with, without accretion, the black hole? Do you with only see this when you have accretion turned on? Ah, no, in my simulation. Uh, well, in the simulation, I don't resolve the inner region of the... Of the right, but do you have these black holes accreting? That's yeah, well, this, this alignment, this alignment is uh, observable in my simulation only when the black holes are accreting, otherwise, otherwise M dot is equal to zero and uh, no gas particles are accreting, so we don't have any kind of torque right. onto the black hole. So this is true only considering true our prescription for the accretion and only the simulation where we have the accretion. But it's not a large-scale interaction effect. No, 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 no. It's, it's true only. It's just particles that have some angular momentum. The stuff you're accreting has whatever angular momentum. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why, that's why I thought. Uh, it's not a large-scale torquing effect. Firing the angle of the accretive stuff. So, no, so no, no, well. Is in the plane. That, 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 that's very inefficient. Yeah, the no. The point of the is that when you align the disks, the lever arm that you're interacting with is not the ISCO lever arm, which for a rotating black hole is very small, right. but the lever arm of about 10M. And when you have viscosity warps in the disk, that lever arm is much, much bigger. Yeah. And so it is absolutely not just accreting anything, though, because the stuff that the angle momentum, the specific angle momentum of the particles that you're interacting with is much too high for those particles to be treated. But are you resolving any of that structure? No, no, that, that's the point. So in these simulations, okay, on the point of view of the simulation, this is a small, a small scale interaction. Because the typical uh, length scale for the, warp di for the warp radius, so this kind of radius, is of the order of 1,000 spatial radii, right? Something like that. 
that is much bigger than the than the last stable orbit, but is very very small with respect to the spatial resolution of our simulation. So that's why I said that we model an unresolved accretion disk. So yeah. So when you want to increase the modulus of the spin of the supermassive black hole, you're looking at the angular momentum that you accrete onto the supermassive black hole. But this is why the, the, the burden peterson effect is more efficient and that happens faster and we, can, and we can see an orientation of the spin without a changing in the, in the, in the modulus, right? Even accreting only a few percent of the secondary supermassive black hole, of the mass of the secondary supermassive black hole. Okay. okay. And so, well, there are some open issues in particular. We have seen that in a large fraction of ours in my simulations, we form a nuclear core, a nuclear core in the center, so we have a sort of last parsec problem as well as in the stellar case. And to solve this, probably, we should uh, allow the gas to, to trigger gravothermal instabilities, and to do that we need denser or colder disk, and in particular we plan to implement radiative cooling and uh, supernova feedback in the disk, and uh, of course radiative cooling is because you form a structure, more dense, denser structure with denser and colder structure in the disk, and you can exchange orbital angular momentum of the gaseous particle more efficiently by self-gravitation, but the point is that without, and we already did it, but without implementing a supernova feedback, we don't, our disk doesn't, you know, seem like the disk we expect in the center. So we need, we need a physical heating source in the, in the circunuclear disk. And the second possible uh, improvement in our simulation is to use cosmologically motivated initial conditions and not a, a you know, a disk at the equilibrium at, at the beginning. So, well, these are my conclusions. In the particular, we saw that a massive black hole binary forms during my simulations that uh, typically for, uh, for a gamma equal to 5 over 3, they stall, the massive black hole binary stall at few parsec separation. And uh, before the formation of a binary, there is a net effect of circularization so that the binary is uh, almost circular if the, black hole, the secondary black hole is initially co-rotating with respect to a circunuclear disk, and we have an orbital angular momentum of the secondary supermassive black hole if it's initially counter-rotating, we predicted a variable, a highly variable accretion process during the spiral. And as last point, we predicted that the spins of the two supermassive black hole align well before the formation of the binary. That can be interesting uh, consequences on to the the calling velocity. And this is the important message. The supermassive black hole pairing really depend on the gas thermodynamics and of course depend, but less strongly, on the orbital parameter of the supermassive black hole and on the possibility of accretion processes during their orbital evolution. Thanks.